Morse code was a method of transmitting textual information as a series of on-off tones that could be directly understood by a skilled listener. Example. Hello world. Good to see you guys this morning again. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much for hanging out. My goodness, the new school year is already starting. Parents, are you excited for that? You know, some parents are probably like, yes, I'm ready for my kids to go back to school. Uh, ready for them to get an education, uh, but just kind of uh, getting them ready and prepared in school. And so I know um, that is all going on, and, and we, we do. And uh, just remind me, in case I forget, we do want to pray for our students uh, before we close out this morning. We want to pray for our teachers, administrative staff, all of them. Uh, just pray for the new school year. So again, if I, re if I forget at the end, remind me of that. But I want to thank you again for being here this morning. I want to thank those of us, those of you that are joining us online, friends all over. And uh, we've been on this series called Morse Code. And if you've missed any of these messages, this is actually week four of Morse Code. And if you've missed any of the messages, you can go to our website, wiredalive.com slash media and you can check out uh, all those messages you can listen to them watch them online uh, download them all of that stuff share them with somebody i definitely encourage you to do that because there's a lot of stuff that we've been talking about in this series because like morse code prayer is that old form of communication but is still used today uh, like morse code there's a uh, very few people that uh, really know how to kind of how to do it, if you will, um, how to go about it, how to work it, and that sort of thing, how to work the instrument. Um, and, and one of the things that we've been discovering over the last couple of weeks is like Morse code, prayer is, is misused in some ways as well, or, or very few people, and even Christians, very few Christians, know exactly what this idea of prayer is. And so we've been investigating that. We've been talking about that over the last couple of weeks. And we've been looking at a conversation that Jesus uh, had with his disciples, his, uh, uh, the people that were also listening to him as he was teaching about prayer. And Jesus kind of lays it all out. And I know that prayer is not one of those popular topics. So maybe you're already shutting me off, shutting me down. I just want to encourage you uh, not to. <laughs> Uh, because it actually is a whole lot bigger and better than we think. And, and one of the things that we've discovered over the last couple of weeks is that um, a lot of times we see prayer as just limited to uh, just going to God and saying, God, I need help. God, I need something. And, and that's all prayer is. But in reality, prayer is so much bigger and it's so much better than that. And Jesus actually goes into what exactly prayer is as he, as he teaches on it and, and as we discover uh, some of the things that he, that he says. Prayer is so much bigger, it's so much better, and actually a real uh, or an easy definition is prayer is the opportunity that we have to build our relationship with God. Yeah, God wants to have a relationship with you. That God doesn't just want to have a relationship with the priest or the pastor or the bishop or somebody else that everybody thinks for whatever reason that we're closer to God than everybody else when we're really not, that I'm no closer to God than you are, and that God wants to have a personal, intimate, thriving, growing relationship with you. Personal. He wants to have that with you, not through somebody. He wants to have it personally with you. And that's the, that's the big aspect of what prayer is all about, is that it's the opportunity that we get to conversate with God to conversate with the creator of everything, to, to communicate with God and God communicating with us, that that's what prayer is, that it's not just limited, although it includes, it's not limited, but it includes asking God for help. And, and we talked about that last week. And again, you can check out that message, but it's not just limited to that. 
But there's so much more. And so Jesus has this conversation where he's teaching about prayer, and he's kind of laying it out. He says, here's what prayer looks like. And so we pick it up. Matthew, one of his disciples, actually records it, and he writes this, Jesus speaking. So when you pray, you should pray like this. Now, one of the things that we've discovered is that Jesus was not giving us a prayer to pray verbatim. That he was not saying, this is what you need to pray verbatim every morning when you wake up and every night before you go to bed. That's not what Jesus was saying. What Jesus was laying out is he says, when you pray, pray like this. He says, here's a model. Here's a model for you to use that when you go before your heavenly father who cares about you, who loves you, who wants a relationship with you, Make sure that you're going before your heavenly father in the right manner. Make sure that the relationship is not just limited to, oh, well, I'll go to God when I need something. I'll go to God when I need help. Because God wants to be so much more involved in every single one of our lives. That God wants that personal relationship. And by that personal relationship, think of the personal relationships that you have. Whether you're a parent and you have a child or children, or whether you're in a relationship with a significant other, whether you're married or uh, uh, you've got a BFF, you know, you've got your friends. I mean, think of all those relationships. When you have those relationships, it's like they're, that person, whoever that person is, they are personally involved in your life. I mean, they're, they're giving you information, and you're giving them information. They help you at times, and, and you help them at times, and, and you encourage each other, and, and you even get in each other's faces at times and, and correct each other and, and all of those things. But the fact of the matter is anybody that, has a, that we have a personal relationship with, we are personally investing in their lives, and they are personally investing in our lives, aren't they? And that's exactly what prayer looks like as it relates to our relationship with God. Or actually, that's what it should look like, and that's what Jesus is laying out here. That it's not just going to God saying, God, I need your help, I need something, although it includes that, but that it is so much more than that. It's a personal relationship where God wants to invest in our lives. That God wants to make investments into our lives. We talked about blessing last week and and that God wants to uh, fill us richly with every need that we have. That God wants to take care of every single one of our needs. And that God wants to bless our very socks off. That God wants to bless our lives even so much more than we can think, imagine, dream up of how somebody can bless us. God wants to bless. God wants to supersede that in blessing of our lives. And so Jesus says, here's the model. Here it is laid out. And so he goes on and he says, our Father in heaven, we talked about that again. Uh, Each message stands alone, but they also build on one another. Again, I can't encourage you enough, man. Go back if you've missed any of these or even just to go check them out again, wiredalive.com slash media. But Jesus says, our Father in heaven, may your name always be kept holy. He said, man, make sure you worship God. Make sure you worship the Creator. He goes on, may your kingdom come and what you want be done here on earth as it is in heaven. God wants to invest his vision. He wants to invest his purpose in our lives. He wants to give us us a reason for living. I mean, it's amazing as we look around in our culture, as we look around just in our city, just in our city, how many people are just lost? How many people are just are just scattered and and how many people are just going they're just doing the nine to five and they're just going through the routine and and they're they're not really living for anything and there's really not any purpose other than hey i'm just trying to make it through the week i mean think about that for a moment and and maybe this is you and i'm not i'm not trying to dog you out here but but maybe this is you that if if you're if if your attitude or if your mindset or if the vision for your life is just i'm just trying to make it through the week is that really a great vision i mean think about that i'm just trying to make it through the week you know what i want to have purpose for my life i want to be on this earth for i want to be on this earth for something bigger than myself I want to have purpose. I want to have a reason for living. I want to have vision for my life. I mean, so often we look at organizations like a church or a nonprofit, another nonprofit organization or a business. We look at these organizations and a lot of times we just think, well, yeah, you know, when you, you're working for a, a big corporation or even a small business, 
that they usually have a mission statement, they usually have a vision statement, and we just think that it's limited to big organizations or small businesses or businesses in general. Organizations in general should have a mission statement and a vision statement. But the reality is we need to personally have a vision and a mission statement for our lives. What are we going after? Because here's the reality, friends, is that your Father in heaven, He loves you so much, and He wants to invest vision into your life. He doesn't want you to just say, hey, I'm just trying to make it through the week. I'm just trying to get by. I hope that I make it. I hope that I get through. I hope that I don't get fired. I hope that I can pay my bills. Now, I know that some of those things are a reality of life, and God wants to take care of that too, but the point is this, is that God is not satisfied with you just living a mediocre life. He wants so much better than that for you so much better Jesus said I came that you would have life and if Jesus stopped there I would have looked at Jesus if I was there at that moment Jesus said I came so that you could have life I would have looked at Jesus in the face and said duh Jesus I already have life can you give me something a little bit better no disrespect but I would be like you know Jesus I already have life But Jesus didn't stop there. Jesus said, I have come so that people would have life and not just have life, like not just know what life is about, not just know what truly living is all about, but to have that life to the fullest. And that's what God, friends, he wants for your life. And that's what he wants for my life is he wants us to live the very best life that we could ever live right here on planet Earth. Yes, one day we're going to spend, we're going to fully step into eternity and and everything's going to be perfect just like it was back in the garden. Everything is going to be awesome and everything's going to be great. One day when we fully step into eternity, when we go to heaven, there's not going to be any more pain, any more struggles, and there's not going to be any more difficulties and hardship. But that doesn't mean that just because that is going to happen one day that God doesn't that that God doesn't want that for our lives today. In fact, Jesus said here in in the model, laying out the model. He says, "God, let your kingdom come. Your will be done." In other words, God give us a slice of heaven here on earth. Here on earth. Now, I don't know why I'm 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 staying staying right here cuz I wasn't planning on staying here that long. But I just think somebody needs to hear that God has an awesome vision, an awesome plan, an awesome purpose for your life. You need to know that. Verse 11, he says, give us the food we need for each day. And so Jesus says, hey, God's there. When you're in need, that God wants to take care of that need. Forgive us for our sins just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. And so there's that aspect of when we go before God, there's an aspect of confessing our faults and our our failures. And do not cause us to be tempted, but save us from the evil one. Protection. Going to God and saying, God, give me your protection. We usually use this in so many ways for traveling mercies, but God, give us protection. Your kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours forever. Amen. In other words, Jesus ends off with thanksgiving. The center of attention is, on, is, is God. God is the center of attention when we, when we come to him in prayer. And not only is God the center of attention, but God is responsible for the relationship. It's like that parent-child relationship. Parents, whether you realize this or not, you're responsible for your child. Can I get an amen? Because some parents relinquish that responsibility, and some of you, you know what I'm talking about. Some parents just kind of like let their child do whatever they want and then they don't teach them, they don't train them, they don't show them right from wrong and, and all of those things. Parents, you're responsible for your child. You're the, you're the one that's responsible in the relationship. And so as we look at that parent-child relationship, it's the same with our relationship with God. That God is the center of attention, but he's also the one that is responsible for the relationship. So when we confess or when we're seeking protection or when we want God's vision, his knowledge, understanding, uh, wisdom, all of those things, his plan, all of that stuff, God is the one that's responsible for the relationship. And he doesn't mind it one bit. He wants to be responsible for the relationship. God wants that. Your heavenly father, he wants that for you. He wants that for your life. Now, each week we've been kind of dissecting each one of these uh, verses, just kind of breaking them down. And this week, we're going to look at verse 12. Forgive us, Jesus says, forgive us for our sins, just as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. 
That word forgive, it means to, to leave out. It means to send away, send away our sins, leave out our sins. It means to cancel our sins. It means to forsake our sins. The word sins means, it means a debt. It means that it's something, something is owed. Something is, you're, you're in debt. Something that is, something that is, uh, uh, something that is, uh, that is owed, you're in debt. It also means to morally fail. And so notice that Jesus is laying out this model. He's laying out this example. And he says, when you come before God, go to God and say, God, forgive me of my sins. God, leave out, leave out what I owe you. Leave out my debt. Leave out, forsake my debt. Forsake what I owe. Forsake my moral failure. Forsake all of those things. Forgive me of all of my sins. Leave out those things. Jesus says that we can go before God and we can ask God for forgiveness. Now, the reality is this. Whether you believe this or not, or whether you are willing to accept it or not, Every single one of us have made mistakes in our lives. Every one of us. I mean, go back to your elementary school days. Go back there, and, and did you make any mistakes in, when you were a kid? Anybody lie? Anybody, did anybody cheat on, on a test? Or did anybody, um, you know, do something to a friend that wasn't good, that wasn't right? Go back to middle school. What did you do in middle school? Was there any mistakes that you made in middle school? Did you do anything that wasn't right, anything that wasn't good? Or, or how about high school? Or how about yesterday? What was it that happened yesterday? Was there something? Did you, did you mess up in your words? Did you mess up in your actions? Or did you have this, this wrong thought come in? And, and did you dwell on that, and, on that thought? And sin is anything that is wicked, anything that is perverse, Anything that is bad, and, and although our culture has kind of clouded right and wrong and good and bad, I mean, because <clears throat> in the culture we live in today, we, are, we call what is actually bad, we call it good, and what is wrong, we're, we're calling it right, and so things can get very, very cloudy. But in all reality, we know, don't we, between right and wrong, we know between good and bad, I mean, we really know, and there are some things that we need direction on, we need wisdom on, and, and the Bible, God's Word, God gives it to us and, and instructs us in those things. But in all reality, we know how we should treat another human being. We know what, what's right and what's good and, and the way that we should conduct ourselves around other human beings, other people, and family members and friends. We know about all of that stuff. Well, here's what, what Paul said in relationship uh, to sin. Because we're all there. We've all been there. Romans 3.23, Paul writes this. Because all people have sinned. That word sin means to miss the mark. Because all people have sinned, they have fallen short of God's glory. Because all people have sinned everywhere. See, you're not special. I mean, you are special, but you're not special in, in, in the sense that you've made mistakes too. I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one who's lied in my past. I'm not the only one who's cheated in my past. I'm not the only one who's messed up with my words and, and uh, you know, had bitterness and resentment in my past. I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one who's done wicked things and perverse things. I'm not the only one. Every single one of us, we all fall short of God's glory or we all fall short of God's perfection because of our imperfection. We fall short of God's perfection because we've missed the mark. Perfection, or the, the bullseye is perfection. And we miss it. I mean, we just have to accept that, that reality. We miss it from time to time. We miss the mark. And so because we've all sinned and, and we fall short of God's glory, there is no way that we can be like God because we're, we're imperfect and God's perfect. I don't know how many of you watch the, uh, watch the show uh, American Ninja Warrior. Anybody watch American Ninja Warrior? Awesome, awesome show. Uh, men and women uh, get in there, and they are just running through an obstacle course that tests their strength, that tests their agility, dexterity. I mean, mind, you know, you're just testing your, your mind and all of those things. And so you're going through this course, and in, uh, usually at the end of uh, uh, some of the courses— 
or actually, yeah, at the end of uh, uh, most of the courses, but they're going through all these obstacles, all these different things, uh, uh, trying to go up a cargo net, uh, trying to make it through like a, um, uh, like a rolling log, or just trying to use all of these, do, all, do this obstacle course, get through it to the very end. Well, the very end usually has this 14-foot, what they call a 14-foot warped wall. And now it sounds like when you watch this thing on TV, you're like, man, I could do that. Yeah, I got that. Ain't a problem. And then you see people start going through it. You see their struggle. And in, in reality, it's, it's a wall that is going up. It's got a little bit of slant to it, but it also kind of curves, kind of like that. It kind of does like a, has a, a boomerang feel to it. And so it's not something that you could just kind of run up real fast. It's something you actually, uh, it, it's actually something you have to run up in the sense of you got to use your feet to kind of climb it in a sense. Well, it's amazing how you just, you, you watch it, and when they show the angle of the wall, then you actually see the difficulty of it. But you, you see these people, and they're going up, and they're going up, and some just miss it by a mile, and then you get those, they get three tries at it. You, you see those that are just going, and they're, they're, they're reaching, they're grabbing, and you see they're just their fingertips get up there, and they slide off, or they get their fingertips up there, but they fall short. They fall short. They get the three tries, and the third try, they run and get up there, and they get the fingertips up there, but they fall short. And that's like you and I falling short of God's perfection. We fall short. I mean, that's a reality. We are not perfect. And every single one of us have fallen short of God's perfection. Now, Paul continues on in this discussion a little bit later on here in, in the book of Romans, or this letter to the Romans, and actually it's Romans 6.23. This is 3.23, Romans 6.23. Paul writes this, the apostle Paul writes, the payment for sin, all right, the payment for missing the mark, the payment for moral failure is death. So every single one of us, we have a, we have a job, and, and every single week or every two weeks, we're expecting a paycheck. We're expecting our wages for the work that we put in. Well, the wages of sin or the payment or the paycheck that is received for sin is death. That's the paycheck is, you know, wow. I mean, you thought that your paycheck was bad. I mean, this is a pretty bad paycheck. I mean, how would you like to get the paycheck of, hey, thank you for working all week. Here's your paycheck. It's death. What? You know, I don't want death. I want life. But the paycheck for sin, the paycheck for missing the mark, is death. And every single one of us are in that same boat. But notice what Paul goes on to say. But the gift that God freely gives. Now, a gift is something that is already freely given. But Paul is doing this. He's like, well, just in case you're not sure what a gift is, let me just kind of do a double take on this. Let me just kind of say it twice. The gift that's freely given... The gift that God freely gives is everlasting life found in Jesus Christ, our Lord. In other words, yes, every single one of us have sinned. Yes, every single one of us have missed the mark. Yes, every single one of us have fallen short of God's perfection. Every single one of us have imperfection. Every single one of us. And the payment for that is death. That's what you and I deserve. That's what every single person on the face of this earth deserves. Now, yeah, maybe we didn't sin or maybe we didn't do what Adam and Eve did and allowed sin to, to come into the world. The world was perfect. Adam and Eve walked away from God. Sin entered into the world. But here's, here's the reality, friends. Is let's put that aside for just a second. Yeah, okay, Adam and Eve are in fa at fault. They messed it up for all of us. But every single one of us are responsible for our own lives, are we not? And every single moment of every single day, we make choices and we're either choosing wisely or we're choosing foolishly. We're either making good choices or we're making bad choices. We're making the right choices or we're making the wrong choices. And so even if, let's just take Adam and Eve out of the equation, all right, and although they've messed it up for all of us, we're also responsible for making some foolish choices in our lives, aren't we? I mean, we're also responsible, we're responsible for making some foolish decisions, some bad decisions, some wrong decisions. And the payment for our faults, our mistakes, our failures is death. But notice that the gift that God freely gives is eternal life. 
See, God wants and God has eternal life for every single one of us. And so just like we talked about in communion, that God is the one that so loved the world that he gave his one and only son for every single one of us so that we wouldn't die in our sin. And and when it's talking about the payment of, of sin is death, it's not just talking about physical death, but it's talking about spiritual death from the standpoint of being eternally separated from God. See, because unholiness can't stand in the face of holiness, can't stand in the presence of holiness, God. Imperfection can't stand in the presence of perfection, in the presence of the perfect God. Can't do it. And so the payment of sin is death, not just that physical death, but also that spiritual death. But God took care of that. His very character, his very nature, love, compelled him to do something about your situation, about my situation, about every single person's situation on this earth, if we choose it, because it's a gift. But that gift implies that there's something we've got to open. There's something that we've got to, that we've got to, that's kind of wrapped up like any other gift that we've got to open up and say, okay, yeah, I want that. We've got to make a choice whether we want the gift that God has for us. And I'm just thinking, man, who wouldn't want that? Like, who wouldn't want that free gift of salvation? Who wouldn't want that free gift of eternal life when the payment of sin is death, the payment for missing the mark is death, but God stepped in to give us life and to give us life to the fullest. Now, uh, if you've ever played poker, um, I don't know if that's my microphone. That's If you've ever played poker. Yeah, actually, the battery died. So if you ever play poker, <clears throat> if you ever play poker, uh, usually when you have your hand and it's your turn, uh, you've got you've to place your bet. And so you may hear the term, you may hear the sentence, I see your 10 and I'm going to raise you 20, or I see your 100 and I'm going to raise you 200. Well, God saw our death and he raised us life. Or actually, he raised us to life. God saw our death. He saw that we had death. He saw that that was, that, that, that was, the, uh, that that was the result, that that was going to be the end result, is that we were going to have death. And God, instead of giving us the death that we deserved, he gave us life. In other words, God wants to forgive us of every and all, of, of every sin that we've ever committed. Let me ask you something. What have you done? What have you done that's been bad? What have you done that's maybe been wicked, maybe been perverse. God wants to forgive your sin. He wants to forgive that sin that's in your your life. And in fact, uh, Exodus or or Moses uh, talks about uh, going to God and he says, God, I want to see, I want to see your glory. I want to see your your perfection. I want to see your your greatness. And in Exodus 34, 6, actually God tells him, well, you can't see my face because if you see my face, you'll die. Nobody could see the face of God as far as his holiness, his greatness, and and live to to tell about it. And so he's like, you know, I I can't show you my face, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass by you, and you're going to see my fullness. You're going to see my glory. You're going to see my perfection. And so Moses writes this. He says, then he passed, God passed in front of me, in front of Moses, calling out, the Lord, the Lord, a compassionate and merciful God, patient, always faithful, and ready to forgive. Notice that. The Lord. So God, God's passing by Moses, and he calls out his own name. He says, the Lord, the Lord, a compassionate and merciful God, patient, always faithful, and ready to forgive. Do you know why God is ready to forgive? Because he's compassionate, because he's mercy, because he's patient, and he's always faithful. That's why God's ready to forgive. That's why he could forgive us, because he's compassionate, because he's merciful, 
because he's patient and he's always faithful. Now, one of the things that you find as you read throughout the Bible is actually there are different writers that pick up on what God said here about himself. Different writers that said the same thing, that, that actually repeated verbatim what God said. And, and the reason being is because they were just like, man, you know, here's God. He's telling us he's compassionate. He's merciful, that God is patient and that God is faithful. And actually, one of the things that we find throughout the Bible, as far as not just those that repeat these very words verbatim, but we also see different writers that just write about God's compassion. Man, God is just compassionate, that God's merciful, that God's patient, that God's forgiving, and that God's faithful, and all of these things. Well, one in particular, actually several different ones, I think Nehemiah was one of them, but David, second king of Israel, actually wrote, or actually wrote about these very things that, that Moses penned down that God said. And David says this, and he adds, kind of adds a little bit to it. He says, the Lord is compassionate, Psalm 103, verse 8. The Lord is compassionate, merciful, patient, and always ready to forgive. So notice, he's reminded of and he remembers what God told Moses. And, and it's like the writers of the Bible, they were passing it down from generation to generation saying, hey, we want you to know God is compassionate, that God is merciful, that God is patient, and that God is faithful, and that he's ready to forgive every single one of your sins. And so verse 9, he goes on. He says, he will not always accuse us of wrong or be angry with us forever. I mean, do you, have you ever come across that person that they're still maybe a family member maybe a friend co-worker they're still upset at you for something you did a year ago anybody know somebody like that they're still accusing you they're still holding holding something against you that happened a year ago that happened maybe years ago or maybe even months ago but notice what David says about God he says he will not always accuse us of wrong or be angry with us forever. How awesome is that? Because God's compassionate, because he's merciful, because God's faithful, because God's forgiving, God's patient. He goes on, he says, he has not treated us as we deserve for our sins or paid us back for our wrongs. That God hasn't done that. He hasn't paid us back for our wrongs. In fact, as we see that Paul wrote, he said, hey, the payment of sin is death. The payment for missing the mark is death. But The gift that God freely gives is eternal life, that God has life, and that God wants to freely give that to us, that God's not saying, wait, well, you got to work for that. You got to work for that life if, if you want it. He goes on to say, he says, as high as the heavens are above the earth, that is how vast his mercy is toward those who fear him. Notice that. As high as the heavens, the heavens are way out there. As high as the heavens are from the earth, that's how vast his mercy, that's how great God's mercy is. As far as the east is from the west, that is how far he has removed our rebellious acts from himself. Now, notice that. As far as the east is from the west, he's removed all of our mistakes, all of our failures, anything that we've done wrong, any way that we've ever failed, any words that we shouldn't have said, any things that we shouldn't have done. God has removed those as far as the east is from the west, or God offers that to us, offers that forgiveness to us if we want it in that free gift of Jesus Christ, that God wants that for us. And so David is just reminding his readers, he's reminding us, he's saying, hey, God's compassionate. God is merciful. God is faithful. God is patient. He's ready to forgive. In fact, I think of like the the runner that's at the starting block, and he's got both feet in in the starting block. He's ready to run the ra- run run the race. He's just waiting for that gun to sound. He's waiting for the sound to let them know, hey, it's time to go. And and he's running. He or she is running for first place. They want to get across that finish line. They want to get first place. They want to get they want to get the best time. And so that runner, I mean, notice in, in the picture, I mean, that runner's ready. He's set. They're in, their, they're in their stance. They're ready to go. And once that gun goes off, they're gone. 
And just like that runner is ready to run the race, God is ready to forgive you of every mistake and every failure that you've ever made in your life, that you made yesterday, that you made last week, months back, years back, that God wants to forgive your sin, that God wants to forgive that moral failure, that mistake, that missing of the mark, that God is, here's what God's not doing. God's not sitting on his throne and like, "Ah, I don't know. Should I forgive him? And this is about the 20th time he's done that. (sighs) I don't know. Let me let me just think about this for a moment. No, you know what God's doing? You know what God's doing? Like we think about a king sitting on his throne and we think about that ruler sitting on their throne. And they're just kind of sitting back in their throne, just kind of like chilling. Yeah, I'm the king. You know what God's doing? God's in the starting block, and he's just ready, man. He's just saying, man, just go ahead. Just ask me for forgiveness, man. Just do it. I'm ready. I'm ready to forgive you every sin. Yep, you made a mistake. Go ahead, man. Just confess it. I'm, I'm ready. Man, I know you, you made a mistake with your, your words. Just, just go ahead. Just say the words. I'm ready to forgive you. Did you know that? That God is ready. He's just standing there in that stance ready to forgive you of every sin that you've ever committed, every mistake that you've ever made. That God is ready in the starting block. That God's not thinking about it and wondering, well, should I forgive them or not? God's God's not doing that. Why? Because God's compassionate. Because God's merciful. Because God's faithful. God's patient. He's ready to forgive. And where that comes from is his very character and his nature. God is love. And since he's love, now hold on to this. Since he's love, then he's compassionate, he's merciful, he's patient, he's faithful. And that makes him ready to forgive. Now the reason I want you to hold on to that, and the reason I talked about all of that, all of our mistakes, all of our failures, Everything we've ever done wrong is not just because God wants to forgive us. That's a big part of it. But did you notice the second half of what Jesus said? Verse 12, forgive us for our sins, just as we have forgiven those who sinned against us. It's always easy. It's always easy for us to say, God, I need forgiveness, and and even go to others and say, hey, you need to forgive me. But then it's always hard to forgive people for the things that they've done against us. Now, I'm not making light of some big hurts that maybe you've had in your life. I'm not making light of anything that that is just, you know, somebody hurt you really badly, maybe physical abuse, emotional abuse. I'm not making light of that at all. But here's what I am saying is, Look back at your history. Look back at your past. I need to look back at my past. And listen, I know personally my own life better than you do. And just like you know your personal life better than I do. And when I look back at my personal life, I see time after time how God did not give me what I deserved. How God didn't sit there and punish me, how God didn't hold my sin against me, how God just stayed angry, uh, stayed angry with me, that God didn't do any of that. But what I found, as I look back at my past, I see time and time again where God is showing his mercy, where God is showing his compassion, where God's showing his grace, where God's showing his, uh, his faithfulness, where God's showing his patience. And now I know for some of you, This is a hard thing because of what that person did. But here's what forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is action. It's simply saying, you know, I recognize that that person did me wrong, but I'm going to let them go. I'm going to release them. I'm going to forgive them of that hurt. Now, if it's something big, you probably won't forget it. And there's some of you here this morning, maybe it's not even somebody. Maybe it's you. Maybe you need to forgive yourself. Maybe you need to say, man, I can't believe I did that, but God has forgiven me. Maybe you need to forgive yourself. And so just like that compassion and just like that mercy and that patience and that faithfulness is what makes God ready to forgive, 
compassion, mercy, patience, and faithfulness is what, is what makes you and I ready to forgive. See, we're wondering, well, how do I forgive? How do I forgive? Well, we start exercising a little compassion. We start exercising a little mercy. We start exercising a little bit of patience, a little bit of faithfulness. Or in other words, we used to look, look back at our past and we see how God has done us and we turn around and we do the same thing to somebody else. How has God done us? He's forgiven us, friends. He's forgiven us of every and all sin, of every mistake. Who are we to hold sin against or hold what somebody else has done, hold that against them? In fact, Jesus said it like this. And then Jesus wasn't using figurative speech here. He wasn't sugarcoating anything. He wasn't using figurative speech. He wasn't describing this isn't an, an analogy. Jesus said, if you don't forgive people of their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive you of your sins. That's just straight, straight talk. If you don't forgive others, your Father in heaven will not forgive you. Why? Because your Father in heaven has forgiven you of every one of your faults, failures, mistakes, all of those things. And so the same way that he exercises all of those traits toward us is the same way that we should exercise that, exercise that toward one another, toward others that have hurt us. And, it's, and even, even those big hurts, yes, we need to forgive that person. It's not hurting them. It's hurting you. It's a poison that is growing inside of you. Every time you think of it, what do you do? You get more angry. You get more bitter. You get more resentful. And so here's what I, wanna, I, I want us to do. I just want to close out with this. And I want you, and I've already been honest because I've already kind of heard this message several times as I've gone over it and I've had to ask myself the question. I want you to ask yourself this very question. What debt do I need to cancel and whose debt do I need to cancel? What debt do I need God to cancel? And whose debt do I need to cancel? So first off, what is it that you need God to cancel right now? That you just know, hey, this has been between me and God. This has been my mistake. This has been my failure. This is whatever you've done. God's ready. He's ready to forgive. All you got to do is like Jesus said in the model, say, God, forgive me for my mistake. Forgive me for my failure. And then whose debt do you need to cancel? Is it a family member? Is it a friend? Somebody that used to be your friend. And maybe you haven't talked for weeks. Maybe months. Maybe years. Is it time? Is it time to cancel that debt just like God's canceled your debt? Maybe it's a coworker. Somebody that just did you wrong. And maybe it's somebody that did you wrong in your childhood when you were a teenager and you don't even know where they are you don't even know how to locate them and I'm not saying that you have to go to these people and, and that sort of thing but maybe it's just time to forgive them for what they did close your eyes with me for just a moment let's just take this moment and if there's anything that you're thinking of just give it to God what is it that you need God to cancel See, God, God's not interested in forsaking you. He's interested in forsaking your sin. He's interested in getting rid of your sin because he knows that that's holding you back from greatness. He knows that that's holding us back from greatness and holding us back from the life that he intends for us. And so God, right now, we just confess our sin, just confess our mistakes, just confess our failures. We receive your forgiveness over our lives. And God, if there's anybody that we can think of that we know that we haven't forgiven them, Lord, would you bring that person to our mind? Would you bring them to our attention? Because right now, even if, even if we can't think of anyone, and even though there might be somebody, God, we just say, Lord, we just forgive. Just forgive. I just forgive, God, any family members that have hurt me in any way. I just forgive, God, any, any friends in the past. God, I just forgive, Lord, any coworkers in the past that, 
hurt me in a big way. I just forgive. I don't, I don't want to harbor resentment. I don't want to hold on to unforgiveness. I don't want to have it in my heart. I just forgive. I just want to forgive God. Forgive every single person that has hurt me in any way. Because, God, I don't want anything to stop your forgiveness from coming in my life. So, God, we just receive your forgiveness. and We forgive those that have done anything wrong to us. With every eye closed, right where you are, maybe you've never surrendered your life to Jesus. And this is where I was talking about that it's a gift that God offers the world, that God so loved the world that he sent his son. And Jesus is that gift that died for us and came back to life so we could be forgiven of our sins, set free, and have a new life and have life after death. He canceled through his life, his death, his resurrection. He canceled your debt. And if you've never given your life to Jesus, I want to give you that opportunity. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to ask you to come to the front. All I want you to do right where you are with every eye closed, all I want you to do is just slip your hand up. You've never surrendered your life to Jesus. If that's you this morning, just slip your hand up right where you are. I just want to make sure that we don't miss anybody that's here. Awesome. God, we thank you again for your compassion. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your faithfulness, your patience that makes you ready to forgive. And God, we want to have those same traits in our lives so that we're always ready to forgive those who have done us wrong. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus praise this morning.